Well, hello everyone on this scorching hot Sunday. Welcome to Church Online for Hillsong Phoenix, Scottsdale, Mesa, Glendale, Tucson, and Las Vegas, Nevada, or wherever you may be joining in from today. That's right. And whether you're watching alone or with friends in a viewing party or from a coffee shop, we're so honored to have you with us today. And we just want to say to you, welcome home. We have worship coming to you from our beautiful downtown cathedral where we've gathered with some campus pastors, <laughs> Hillsong College and church staff. And we're believing for God to do something great in our time together. Today is Pentecost Sunday, which is the day when the early believers were gathered gathered in a home in an upper room in Jerusalem, and there the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. So I believe that God can do some amazing things in your home today by the power of that same Spirit. And Pentecost was also the day that the church was born. So let's believe for God to do great things across the life of our church globally as we gather online today. Wherever you are today, let's lift up the name of Jesus together. We sing. Time moves in rhythm with His hand. Moment by moment, beat by beat. Rolling through death, we'll kick your sin. No red will beat, I'll skip His feet. Then it might sound wild. Chasing heart Mercy by mercy, no by no We lost the pitch, he moved the score Our way with notes, he sweet resort And it might sound wild But wild is why my heart sings roll Sing his praise to the Cause I hope Came all the way With hope we sing Imagine heaven where we stand Not just some distant promised land More than some hopeful dying dream Watch it wind up just as he said When he does we'll see Like we wish we know we should back then And it might sound wild But we don't have to wait till then
You love me out too far. 
worship. God's presence is here, and He is so faithful to meet us every time we call on the name of Jesus. In every space, in every season, no matter what we're going through, we can count on God to be with us. And right now, we're going to take this moment as a church to unite together in prayer. Prayer isn't a last resort. It is divine dialogue with the God of heaven that is powerful and it makes a difference. Hebrews 4.16 says, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive His mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. We can pray with faith today. We can believe together for grace to rush in and help in every area of need. So come on, right where you are, I want to invite you, lift your voice with me, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you are for us and not against us. And we stand firm on your promises today. God, we just thank you that you care about every person and every prayer request. And so we come boldly to your throne right now, asking for help, believing for miracles. And we just lift up some specific prayer requests that people have brought. Someone's praying for salvation and health for a family for a sister who has been battling a 10-year battle with heroin. God, we pray breakthrough in her life right now. Yes. Let, let the circumstances be changed, disrupt what the enemy is doing, yes, and we Jesus pray that you would bring about good in that family. So we're praying for restoration in relationships, peace and unity in relationships with the Son. Lord, you are the God who makes all things new. And so we trust you. We trust you are working. We trust that you are with us and we can count on you to come through every single time. And so Lord, we just pray right now that you would bring peace to every situation that needs it. We pray for unity in our land. We pray for justice at work on our watch. We pray for reconciliation among all people. And we pray, Lord, send revival in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen, amen. Church, I love the fact that we are never short on praise reports. God continues to answer prayer and we're gonna celebrate that. So feel free to clap and praise God from wherever you are, cause it's gonna be good. Do it. Someone is thanking God saying, I was healed from a debilitating attack of vertigo. Oh, Thank you, God. Yes. Someone else says, my brother tested negative for COVID-19, amen. Someone else thanking God, they received a promotion at work. And the last one I'll share says, business is going really well. I've done more business in the past week than I've done all of 2019. How incredible is that? Praise God for good reports. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> I love it. Powerful. Praise God. Hey, so happy that you're with us today. We're setting this time aside for God, just like we've always done. And God is faithful to love and lead us just like he always is. Uh, let's make use of that chat today. Don't stay quiet. We'd love to see you in there. Let us know if something blesses you in church today. Yes. In fact, right now, let us know where you're watching from. What city? What area code? The 480 maybe? If you're linking in through the hillsongphoenix.online platform, you'll see a series of buttons across the top of your screen or in the chat where you can receive live prayer, you can give, and you can get involved. You can also have the chance to let us know that you've surrendered your life to Jesus a little later on in the service. If you're joining us on YouTube, you'll have those same opportunities by texting the number our host will provide now. Now, now. Well, <laughs> hey, we want to take an important moment right now to worship God by receiving our weekly tithes and offering together. Come on. As we give today, I think about the wise men and their offering fit for a king. And then I think about the widow's might when a poor widow gave an offering fit for a king. Today, you're able to give an offering fit for the king. If our heart is to exalt Him and sacrifice for Him, then He reigns in our hearts. Yeah. We can all engage in this moment by clicking the Give button or texting the number on your screen. 
thank you for giving. And I'm gonna pray over you today. Lord, thank you so much for every single person that's a part of church today. I pray a special blessing upon them. God, I pray that you would maximize our giving today. You would maximize it in our community, that it would go to do incredible things for your kingdom, for the welfare of the cities that we live in. God, I pray that you would maximize our giving in our hearts and in ourselves, God, that we would go further longer because we chose to put you first today. Thank you, God, for what you are doing in this season. Thank you for what you're going to do. We are yours. You are ours. We love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Tracy and team. What a beautiful song on this Pentecost Sunday. Hey, this morning we're continuing on with our sermon series on the Psalms of Ascent. 
So grab your Bible and something to take notes on and turn with me to Psalm 122. Now, for those who may be wondering what in the world a Psalm of Ascent is, there are 15 songs in the book of Psalms that were sung by the tens of thousands of pilgrims who made their way up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Israel each year. Just think of Woodstock or Coachella. <laughs> this is actually nothing at all like that, but it does bring an image to mind. These Psalms were the soundtrack of their faith, the mixtape for the road trip, the playlist that they listened to year after year, generation after generation, as they made their pilgrimage back to their beloved city. Now, the reason they are called the Psalms of Ascent is because Jerusalem is high on a hill at about 27 or 2,800 feet in elevation. So they had to climb to reach it. To put it in some perspective, Camelback Mountain right here in Phoenix is about the same height. Sentinel Peak in Tucson is about the same height. And the top of the stratosphere in Las Vegas is less than half the height. Actually, Las Vegas is surrounded by some massive and impressive mountains. So just imagine climbing any one of those mountains while singing, singing while climbing. Can you imagine that? The last time I climbed Camelback Mountain was in October of 2018, and it was with Pastor Brian and with Lee Burns, the executive vice president of Hillsong College, and Pastor Kyle Turner from Kansas City. We actually got a late start and began to climb at about 1.30 in the afternoon. And Pastor Brian had to preach in Mesa that evening. I can promise you, there was no singing on the journey. There was only the sound of <gasps> and the occasional, I think I'm having a heart attack. But we made it, we made it. These songs of ascent are not just songs about geography though. They're songs that draw us upward spiritually. They lift us from loneliness and hopelessness and despair. They flood our hearts with expectation and gratitude. They show us a picture of renewal and recovery and restoration. They're songs of uprising, songs that call us out of one season and into the next. And because of that, these Psalms speak to us right here in this moment, right where we are in this season. Now today, I wanna to take a brief look at Psalm 122. It's a familiar one to most of us. The Psalmist says this, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up. The tribes of the Lord as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There thrones for the judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions sake, I will say peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Now, just before we unpack this, I want to acknowledge the elephant that just walked into the room. I'm not even going to pretend that it isn't ironic that I'm reading a psalm about gathering on site while we're still gathering online. In fact, I have a close friend who is a pastor and he's preaching through the Psalms of Ascent along with me to his church in Houston, Texas. And last week he said to me, Terry, I'm going to hold off on Psalm 122 until we regather on site. And I understand why. For them, it's going to be an epic regathering. But I have way too much OCD in me to skip over one chapter and have to come back to it. So I'm just going to address it head on this weekend. And I know it's ironic, but even more than that, this Psalm is more relevant to me than ever before because I think that most of us are feeling in this moment exactly what the pilgrim songwriter was feeling. He missed going to the house of the Lord. He missed seeing his friends. He missed being with his tribe. He missed even seeing the other tribes gathered as well. He missed those things, just as we all do. I had someone recently say to me, 
I will never take on-site gathering again for granted. Me too. I feel the same way. And to be honest, I think I even did take it for granted without even realizing it. You know, sometimes we take precious things for granted and only when we've lost them do we realize just how much they've mattered. Thank God that our on-site gatherings are not an actual loss. We'll be able to gather on site again in a few weeks and a few months from now, it probably won't even matter that we delayed it for a few weeks. We'll build back in attendance and energy and atmosphere and, and all of that, which is a part of our church. And we'll look back on this and it'll seem but just a small blip on the radar screen of our lives. But on the other hand, some of you may be processing through actual losses in this season. And I realize that some of those losses may not be as easily recovered. Losses like your health or your job or a relationship or an emotional battle. You may be processing through losses that are more difficult to recover. I, I want to encourage you in the light of that to focus on the things that you can get back immediately. You say, what can I get back immediately, Pastor Terry? Well, you can get your faith back. You can take your joy back. You can get your peace back. You can recover your sense of purpose. You can find your confidence once again in God's plan for your life. You don't have to wait on those things. You can take those things back today by faith in the name of Jesus, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, right here on this Pentecost Sunday. And that's what I'm praying for you. It's time for you to take back what the enemy has stolen from you. For King David, the songwriter, he longed to get back into the house of the Lord just like we all do. Even though the people of God were not the physical building in Jerusalem any more than the church is a building today, David knew that there is something beautiful about gathering with God's people. There's something powerful about corporate worship. There's something supernatural that takes place when two or more are gathered in His name. Did you know that there is no gathering of people anywhere on the planet for any other purpose known to man that even compares to the gathering of God's people. And the songwriter is excited to be a part of that again. I think this song is also prophetic. It's not just relevant to us where we are, it's prophetic. I think David is envisioning the birth of the church. And that's something that we celebrate today since Pentecost Sunday is the birthday of the church. Just over 2,000 years ago, on this very day, there were 120 followers of Jesus packed into a living room in an upper room in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2 describes the scene. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Why were there devout men dwelling in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. Why is that the case? Well, again, it's because they had gathered there for the Feast of Pentecost. And as they gathered, they would have sung Psalm 122 on their ascent up to Jerusalem just before God pours out His Spirit and establishes His church. And by the way, one other thing. Since David is a foreshadowing of Jesus, I believe this psalm gives us a little glimpse of the joy that Jesus feels about gathering with His church. Jesus loves His church, and He feels as much joy in gathering with us as we do with Him. Now, I want to briefly just look at five things in 10 minutes highlighted in Psalm 122 and how they relate to every single one of us when it comes to the purpose of the church gathered, whether it's on site or online. 
The first thing I want you to see is the joy of the church gathered. The songwriter says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. He was glad to gather. And can I be really honest? Even though gathering online is not the same as gathering on site, at least we can gather. We can sing together. We can pray together. We can chat with each other and we can hear God's word together. And that brings great joy even in the midst of challenging days. This also gives us the picture of the kind of church that brings joy to the heart of God. He delights in people who see church as something to be enjoyed, not endured, as Pastor Brian often says. And when you think about it, it makes sense because the gathering of the church is actually the gathering of spiritual family. And what father doesn't delight in seeing his family gathered together? A rejoicing church brings joy to the heart of God. You say, well, what do we have to rejoice over in these difficult days, Pastor Terry? Well, we can rejoice because God is in our midst. We can rejoice because he has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. We can rejoice because his promises are sure and his grace is sufficient. We can rejoice because he is good and he does good. He forgives sin. He heals sick bodies. He restores broken relationships. He opens doors of opportunity. He blesses, he promotes, and he makes a way where there is no way. Listen to me. You have much more to rejoice over than you have to grieve over. Now, I'm not saying the losses aren't real, because they are. I'm not saying the pain doesn't hurt, because it does. I'm not saying that you aren't facing some extraordinary challenges, because many of you are. I'm just saying when you look back at what God has already done for you, you have more reasons to rejoice than you have to mourn. You have more reasons to celebrate than you have to grieve. If God never does another single thing for you, and I believe he will. He has already done the most important thing for you. He has forgiven you of your sins. He has given you the free gift of eternal life. He has made you his own. He has claimed you as a son and daughter in his beautiful kingdom. In Psalm 13, 5, David said, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Salvation is not the only miracle God has planned to do for you, but it's the greatest miracle. And on the basis of what he has done, he has planned to do so much more for you. First Corinthians two and verse nine, for I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have even entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I want to encourage you to take your joy back this weekend. God has great things ahead for you, and you don't have to worry or be anxious or be fearful about the future. And the past is the proof that he is working in your future. Being a joyful community helps us to maintain a right perspective. The second thing I want you to see is the strength of the church planted. The songwriter says, our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. In the blink of an eye, he goes from longing to be in God's house to standing in it. And the way that this is worded speaks of being planted with strength. We are firmly planted in the house of God. Psalm 92, 13, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. There is always a direct connection between the depth of our planting and the strength of our stand to the flourishing of our lives. The deeper your roots, the stronger your stance, the more fruitful your future will be. You know, shortly after we moved to the desert about 20 years ago, Judith and I had our first encounter with a giant tumbleweed. We were driving down near Tucson and suddenly, out of nowhere, a tumbleweed the size of a Volkswagen car came blowing across the road out of nowhere. It freaked us out. Freaked! us out. Well, since then, I've seen a lot of tumbleweeds in Arizona. And I've also seen a lot of tumbleweed Christians. And not just in Arizona. 
people who have never been planted in the life of a church. They just roll wherever the wind blows. And in some cases, they have no idea what they're even missing out on. Did you know that the beauty of a life planted is that it can withstand the storms of life? In being planted, you can bear fruit season after season. In being planted, you can become an important part of the ecosystem of a community. You can even become a shade for the next generation to grow up under. But it takes planting your roots deep in the soil of relationships deep in the life of a church, deep in community. Hey, I want to encourage you. Don't forget where you've been planted during this season. Amen. It's easier than ever to drift away when we're not gathering on site. Yeah. But I want to encourage you to make you stand. Be strong. Yeah. Be planted. Yeah. You can do the hard yards. Yeah. The strength of the church planted is seen in how it flourishes over the seasons. And I want that for you. I want to see you flourish in Jesus' name. The third thing that the songwriter shares with us here is the beauty of the church united. The songwriter writes, Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. Now, depending on what translation you're reading, it might say a city closely compacted which is literally true of Jerusalem. The old city of Jerusalem has narrow streets and the houses are closely compacted. In fact, it's so tight that I once heard a man say, my neighbor is so close that I can hear him zip up his pants in the morning. <laughs> That's close. But the songwriter, he's not talking about architecture or urban planning. He's talking about the relationships between the people of God. They are living in peace and unity. Together, they form a harmonious, loving community. And the songwriter sees this in the house of the Lord when it cannot be seen anywhere else. Hey, what could happen in our communities if the church was known for this? What if the church was seen as a place of unity and peace? What if the church was the center for reconciliation in a community? What if the church was the place where all people were treated equally? Yeah. Place where every person is celebrated awesome. yeah. as a Mago Day, as the image of the divine? What if the church made a move to unite people instead of dividing people? Yeah. Well, I think something powerful would happen. And by the way, that's what the gospel working in the church will produce. The good news of Jesus is all about reconciling things divided by the world. The gender division that came about because of sin is united in the gospel. The racial division that came about because of sin is united through the gospel. The socioeconomic division that came about because of sin is united through the gospel. The division between people who are able-bodied and those who need special care is united through the gospel. The gospel unites what sin divides. The gospel unites what religion divides. The gospel unites what the world divides. Come on, somebody. The good news of Jesus is a unifying force in the world. I'm just going to take a praise break right there. Now, to be really honest, being in community means walking through some highs and some lows in relationship while allowing the gospel some time to work in us. What are some highs and lows that you think about when you think about being in community? As I look back over my own journey, my own pilgrimage, I can see more highs than lows. And I hope the same is true for you. Over time, you'll see more good than bad, more better than lesser. What I can promise you is that if you go the distance over time, you will see the beauty and the power of unity at work among the people of God. There, he commands his blessing. The fourth thing I want you to see is the witness of the church to justice. The songwriter says, their thrones for judgment were set, thrones of the house of David. Now, some scholars believe that this is a reference to the idea that pilgrims traveling to the capital would have taken advantage of the opportunity to seek justice and settle disputes. Justice was usually administered at the gates of the city. 
So judges were placed at those locations to see that justice was fairly administered. And since God is a God of justice, justice is connected to the ministry and the witness of the church. Now, it might be hard to see how this can be considered joyful because it references judgment. But that's exactly why it is joyful. If you see judgment as justice based on truth, equality, settling inequities, and releasing oppression, then there's a reason to be joyful. In the Bible, judgment is not just used to reward good and punish evil. It is the expression of God's law for the benefit of those living in the margins. In God's law, the needs of widows and orphans, the needs of the poor and the marginalized, the needs of the sojourner in the land, well, they're all provided for. In God's law, there is an equality for all. So living at the margins, well, you would experience great joy when you're finally brought out from the margins into God's system of judgment. You would know that was an invitation into equality, an invitation into righteousness, an invitation into God's gracious provision. So the pilgrim has experienced great joy because justice can be found in the midst of God's people. Oh, I long for the day when that will be said of the church. There is such a desperate need for justice in the world. I was reminded of that again this week, watching the news reporting the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. It reminded me of other names we've seen in the news over the past few years. Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, Walter Scott, and many, many others. Most recently, Ahmed Aubrey. And all I could think when I saw that was, this is madness. Where is the justice in the land? The murder of a man in the streets of a city by those responsible to save and protect is not just an injustice against the black community. It's an injustice against all humanity. And I want to say, if we allow it to be defined as an issue related only to the African-American community, then it becomes someone else's problem and not ours. But it is our problem, all of ours. Racism, prejudice, inequality, systemic injustice. These are the fruit of a deeper root that we all have to take responsibility for. And as the church, we should take a stand for those not being heard, those not being protected, or afforded the same rights and privileges and opportunities and freedoms as the most privileged amongst us enjoy. The church should stand for justice. And as a result, the nations will say, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. The fifth thing that the songwriter wants us to know is the purpose of the church on mission. The songwriter says, for my brothers and companions sake, I will say, peace be within you for the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Notice the connection between seeking the common good of all people because of what God has done for us in Jesus. The church doesn't exist for its own satisfaction. It exists for the transformation of society. Now, there's an interesting little wordplay here, a play on the words Jerusalem and peace. The word peace is shalom, and the word Jerusalem is Yerushalom. That's like praying, Lord, let the city you love live up to its name and be a city of peace. It takes us back to Jeremiah 29, 7, where Jeremiah says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your own welfare. How do we seek the welfare of the city? Well, we're doing it in so many ways these days through our work in city care. But there are so many more ways that we can all seek the welfare of the city. Seeking the welfare of the city means promoting the means by which people can live flourishing lives. We can each seek the welfare of the city in a million different ways over the long haul, from simple acts of kindness and civility to other things like buying homes and improving neighborhoods, to building businesses and employing those who need jobs, to working in social agencies, 
teaching school or serving in healthcare and as first responders, to finding innovative ways to address illiteracy and poverty, to running for political office, to standing against injustice, caring for creation, raising healthy families, and through simply being the church living on mission. We are called to seek the good of others. In closing, Jesus spoke of another city set high on a hill. Find it interesting that standing in Jerusalem, Jesus said, as beautiful as this city is, as attractive as it has been to pilgrims, as wonderful it has been among the nations, there is another city that I wanna speak to you about. In Matthew 5 and verse 14, he spoke about the church. He said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jerusalem is a picture of the church. Tim Keller once said, what Jerusalem was to the ancient Jews, the church is to believers in Christ. And just as Jerusalem called them upwards, well, the church calls us upward. It's where we become our best selves. It's where we find our greatest joy and contentment. It's where we discover the purpose for our lives and the church gathered, planted, united, standing for justice and living on mission is where we shine bright to the nations. If you've not become a part of the church, I wanna see you become a part of the church, but not through joining the church, but by surrendering your life to the Lord of the church. Jesus wants to give you his salvation and place you in his family, the family of God, which is his church. I said a few moments ago that salvation is not the only miracle, but it's the greatest miracle. The Bible says in Romans 10, if you believe that Jesus is God's son, sent to die for you and raised to life for you, you will be saved. Would you put your faith in Jesus today? Would you trust him for the miracle of salvation? If so, I'd love to lead you in a simple prayer of believing and surrendering to his irresistible grace. Would you say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are God's son, sent to die for me, raised to life for me, so I put my trust in you. I am now a child of God. Salvation is my portion. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. My future begins today in Jesus' name. I just want to give you a big round of applause with all of our pastors in the room today. (laughs) There is a celebration taking place in heaven right now because the Bible says when just one person comes to the Father's table of salvation that all of the angels in heaven throw a party. We're celebrating with you today and we'd love to know about this step of faith that you have taken. So would you just click the button that says, I've raised my hand, or you can put a high five or a hand wave there in the chat line, and we'd love to celebrate with you today and maybe even reach out to you to give you opportunities to begin this new journey of spiritual growth and development. Well, the first thing I wanna encourage you to do as a new follower of Jesus is to join along with the rest of us as we receive communion. Our pastors and college staff and a few of our other leaders in the room today are gonna join with all of us today in remembering the finished work of Jesus. This bread represents his body broken for us and this juice represents his blood shed for us. And as often as we partake of these things, we do so in remembrance of him. So take and eat this as an act of gratitude and remembrance. And now drink the cup in Jesus' name. God, I just wanna sit here in this moment and offer praise to you. We're so grateful for your goodness and for your grace. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for bringing us out of darkness and into light. Thank you for making us your family, for placing us in your church, and for giving us hope beyond these days. Thank you that our lives will be lived 
on mission this week to the glory of God in Jesus' name. Hey, I want to thank you once again for joining us this weekend. There is so much more taking place in the life of our church than this one-hour service, and we'd love to have you join us this week. You can be a part of online connect groups. Tuesday night is Mega Prayer, of course, with Pastor Brian at 5 p.m. The Sisterhood is gathering on Thursdays. Youth and kids are meeting online along with every age and stage of life. And there are always many opportunities to serve in city care. And so with that today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you, church. I look forward to seeing you right back here next weekend for another extraordinary service. Have an amazing week in Jesus' name.